Right, so here we go, we start. So welcome to our meeting, everybody. Um, tonight's talk is on the Perseverance Rover. So for the people on Zoom, I'm now going to uh, share my screen with them. So tonight's agenda, um, what we're going to do is, uh, got some notices to tell you about, uh, then a news item from Len, followed by, um, a presentation from myself on the, the, the rover. And then Richard will do a planetarium visit here uh, in the hall. And uh, we'll have some refreshments after that because we'll need it, I think, at that stage. Um, I just want to mention a few things, safety notices and, and so on. Fire exits, mandatory that you know where those are, the back of the hall and the two sides. Uh, toilets are at the rear and near the main entrance as well. And the barrier and the gate closes at 8.15 p.m. Um, we're testing some devices tonight uh, to improve audibility. So we'll be looking to afterwards to see what happens with those. I know that the loop doesn't appear to be working and we'll have a look at that shortly to see what's going on. Um, just to let you know, this uh, meeting is being recorded um, and I would advise people on the Zoom call to use the speaker view and mute your microphones. And I notice everybody's done that, so I, I didn't have to go and do that, that's really good. Um, I will take questions, but we'll take them at the end of it all. So just a little bit about the Southwest Hearts Astronomical Society, because we've got a few new members as well. Since this time last year, we were about 120 members this time last year, we're now 149, so quite a few people have joined. So not everybody knows a little uh, as much about the society as the regular members. So we were founded in 1968 and we're about 149 members. We do have our monthly meetings here normally from September to May, but with COVID, last month was the first one we had in person since a year uh, last February. Um, they're usually on the last Friday of the month, but feasts and movable uh, events at the school means that we have to chop and change with that. Uh, we do have our own observatory, which is at Flondon, and uh, we have access to the planetarium here at the school. Unfortunately, right now, we can't do it because uh, of the numbers of, and, and the COVID restrictions. It's just too cramped in there to hold the planetarium sessions. But we're hoping that you know, we can get back there again to do it uh, using the Zeiss projector. Uh, we do have a newsletter, but um, I've changed it from being a monthly newsletter to an ad hoc newsletter because we discovered that not many people read it and it takes a bit of effort to put it all together. So what we're gonna do is gonna use the newsletter for uh, highlighting interesting items or events or things like that that crop up from time to time, rather than um, a monthly uh, digest of the previous meeting and uh, some news facts. Uh, just to mention about subscriptions, they are uh, 16 pounds for an individual, 24 pounds for a family. It's an annual membership. But we normally start in January and run to the end of the year. Uh, starting this January coming, uh, whenever you take out a subscription, it'll be uh, one year from the date that you join. Uh, we're going to try that next year to see if that suits people better because we get people joining at all different times of the year. And it, it makes um, sense to try and have it as an annual membership rather than one that you join and that you get a part of the year or a, a bit extra. So. Uh, visit our website. Uh, there's lots of useful information there, and that's typically where we'll put all the information about our meetings. Uh, just a quick mention about this site, because we're visitors here, it's really important that we sort of follow the, the routes that are prescribed for us to use. Here, You follow this central avenue up here, and then across to that. It's a sort of one-way system that they like to, to keep uh, running. It's not so bad in the evening because there aren't, isn't much traffic happening, but uh, Nonetheless, we've got to stick to those rules. The observatory is situated here on the uh, back end of the, the, the block, and uh, it's on top of the roof of the science block, and the planetarium is next door to that. And whenever we go to the planetarium, we use this blue route highlighted there. And uh, it's just information for you to know about. Then, we, of course, we have our own observing site uh, at High Top, which is near Flondon. It's just a quarter of a mile or so south on a, a bridle path down from Flondon Village. And if you want to find it, I'll show you in a minute how you can do that. So there we've got our telescope housed in a, a nice little dome. And um, we do observing on Saturday nights when, when the weather permits. We haven't been doing it over uh, the duration of COVID because we felt it was just too cramped to, for people to be in there, but we're starting to get it back up and running again. 
If you want to find it on Google Maps, just search for SWHAS Observatory and that should find it for you and you can get directions from wherever you live to there. A uh, quick mention now about our upcoming events. Uh, so next month, it will be a tour of the Dunsink Observatory in Dublin. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. Then uh, we have got a tentative date of the 6th of December for a quiz with the Aylesbury Astronomical Society. This may very well end up being a Zoom or it may not happen at all. I've still not uh, ironed out all the details. And then on December the 20th, we'll have our Christmas members images and I bring them by. And uh, hopefully in the new year, in January, we'll have our talk and it'll probably be uh, about the James Webb Space Telescope. So just a few words about Dunsink Observatory in Dublin. It was founded in uh, 1785 and it's a fairly well-established observatory. This is, dome is called the South Dome and it holds a very famous 12-inch uh, grub refractor. Uh, grub were, uh, as you know, a, a major manufacturer of telescopes in that era. The building itself uh, is a scaled down version of what they originally planned, but it's quite a nice building and it, it hosts uh, uh, quite a few of the uh, scientific community. They're split between there and a campus in the middle of the city. And it's run by the Dublin Institute uh, for Advanced Studies. They're called DIAS, D-I-A-S. Astronomy and astrophysics section is, is based in this uh, building. And they undertake all sorts of research, space, weather, planetary science, and so on. Um, they also uh, work in, in conjunction with some of the other space agencies, including NASA and ESA. So, for example, they uh, collaborated with the Solar Orbiter and the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, they also conduct other things, low far, low frequency uh, radio astronomy as well for the European Southern Observatory. They've got a site in Ireland that they, it's part of that network. It, it runs at a low frequency from uh, 10 to 240 megahertz rather than uh, higher frequencies that you're more used to. There is one famous uh, gentleman that occupied the role of director of the observatory, uh, the second director, in fact, William Rowan Hamilton. He's um, not really known so much in astronomy, although he was an astronomer, but his claim to fame is uh, something called Quartanians, which is a way of describing uh, spatial coordinates. Um, he faced a problem that he couldn't describe everything in 3D, and uh, using these, this equation, he came up with a, a, a fourth dimension that helps uh, do that. And it's actually used an awful lot in graphics uh, these days, it's robotics, navigation, um, you know, flight dynamics, all of these things that uh, involve navigation through different dimensions and keeping your relative uh, sense of, of, of direction. It's supposed to be a claim for uh, allowing Tomb Raider to happen in the first place, apparently. Dunsink as well is also a, a fairly important place, uh, so much so that Hamilton actually got a crater named after himself on the moon. This is an upside down view of the moon, so this is on the, the, the southern half if you were to look at the moon directly, and that's called Hamilton Crater. So we look forward to that uh, actual uh, talk next week. It's, uh, it was the centre for timing in Ireland, and everybody knew that Ireland was a bit behind uh, the UK in terms of timing, but it was actually 25 minutes and 16 seconds or 21 seconds behind. That uh, led them to believe that they should sort of unify the time, and in fact, they did. I, if you think about it, it, if you think about the latitudes and longitudes, uh, it's about uh, half an hour in terms of sunsets difference, and that's uh, quite a, a difference when you start taking it into account for navigation. Uh, the guy that's going to give us this talk is Peter Gallagher. Uh, he's a professor there. He's also director of, of the uh, observatory and has been so since 2018. He's a fairly well-claimed guy, and I won't really go into all his qualifications. He'll tell us more about that next time. But he's worked uh, with NASA. He, he's worked at uh, the Big Bear Solar Observatory in California and also at the Goddard Space Center and he's helped with a lot of the ESA projects. So he's a very enthusiastic director of the observatory and we're very lucky that he's going to be the one that's talking to us about it next time. Okay, so we're going to go on to the next piece, which is Len is going to tell us a bit about a news item. So I'm going to stop talking and hand over to Len for a moment. So just bear with me a second. Oh, you do that, okay. Right, well, 
So where does our gold come from? It's been estimated that if you collected all the gold on earth, it would fill just three Olympic size swimming pools. Um, on the one hand, that does seem like quite a lot, but on the other hand, when you consider the size of the earth, it's a tiny amount. Now we, we thought we knew where our gold comes from, but recent research has thrown doubt on that. Next slide, please. Um, all the lighter elements, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, etc., are made in regular stars as a product of nuclear fusion. The heavier elements, iron and above, have been considered to be the product of supernova, like this one, like the picture. In the final collapse of a large star, the pressure and density increases, forming heavier and heavier elements with a final massive explosion, leaving a neutron star or a black hole behind. That was the theory, but recently we've had the ability to see some hard evidence which disputes this. The Earth and occasionally passes through clouds of dust created by supernovae. We know this because the dust ends up on the ocean floor and in the Antarctic ice. We can examine the dust, which we know comes from a supernova because it has a particular isotope of iron. Um, and uh, that's how we know. So what, but what we don't find in that dust is evidence of gold and other heavy elements. Then that was one piece of information. Then even more recently, we can use advanced computer simulation of what happens inside a supernova. And basically there just aren't enough neutrons to make the really heavy elements. So shock horror, gold and heavy elements don't come from conventional supernova. So where does the, where do the heavier elements come from? There's actually several ways that gold and other heavy elements can form. <laughs> in, in all cases, I believe an atom like iron captures neutrons. As these increase, some of the neutrons mutate into protons and the iron therefore becomes a new heavier element. Fred Hoyle proposed that, that this can happen slowly in a red giant. Uh, the physics is complicated, but um, he, he's uh, uh, proposed that, and it's uh, since been uh, proven. If you look at red giants, you can see a small quantity of he heavy elements being generated. Um, however, this is a very slow process, and it can't account for all he heavy elements. A faster process occurs when atoms are bombarded by a deluge of neutrons. Next slide, please. Stars often form as binary systems. There's more binary systems than single systems, I believe. Sometimes both stars turn into supernovas, leaving a pair of neutron stars behind. Their orbits can decay, resulting in something called a kilonova, much more powerful than a supernova. This was a theory proposed in 1974, but due to the gravity, gravitational wave detectors, LIGO, etc., we now have direct evidence of this happening. The long hum and chirp of a gravitational wave caused by two neutron stars merging was detected in 2017. And they triangulated it, quickly turned the telescopes on it. And the exact light curve as was predicted will produce a huge number of heavy elements was, was detected, confirming the theory. So, so that is a, a major way where gold and other elements are produced. However, this isn't enough to account for the amount of gold in the universe. Next slide. This is the last slide, in fact. There is yet another way gold is produced. Very old stars, some of which exist in the diffuse halo of the Milky Way. When I say old, I mean nearly as old as the universe, uh, one of some of the very first stars to form. They exist there. They, um, they're not large stars, otherwise they would have died young, but, um, and they wouldn't contain heavy elements from kilonovas and other sources because they didn't exist when those stars formed. These stars are made of hydrogen and helium. However, a study of these stars has shown evidence of significant amounts of heavy elements. These stars spin very fast, 
And when they finally reach the end of their lives, it's thought that they don't end up as a typical supernova. They're described as collapsars. As the star collapses, it creates a shock wave that causes production of a significant amount of heavy elements. So this is thought to be another major source of gold and other heavy elements. Um, however, finally, even this source plus the kilonova source combined can't account for the amount of heavy elements we find around us. So in fact, we still don't actually know where all our gold comes from. Great, thank you, thank you very much then. So uh, we're gonna go on to the main presentation now. And uh, this is the talk about the Perseverance rover, which landed um, earlier in the year. Uh, Len did a very nice piece, it's one of the news items. Okay, so you can still hear me, hopefully. Right, um, right. so this, this talk, I'm gonna cover a little bit about this rover and why it's different from uh, the other ones that has gone before. So first of all, I'm gonna talk about the science objectives. There we go. So the idea of this uh, rover was to sort of go and study the rocks and landscapes around the landing site that it's uh, gone to, to reveal the history of the actual area that it's investigating, and particularly to look for astrological signs. And this is why they chose that uh, delta as a place to go for. Also, rather than uh, the curiosity uh, and opportunity rovers that went previously, they're not actually analyzing the samples as such at, at the rover uh, interface. They're actually taking samples and caching them. That means putting them aside to be analyzed later. And the idea with, with this rover was so that the samples could be brought back to Earth. So that's a, a different thing for, compared to uh, the previous rovers. Also, they wanted to try out some new technologies uh, that were particularly designed to see how humans might work or visit Mars. So just going on to the origins of these rovers, there has been a history of sending rovers to Mars. And you can see from the list of timelines here on here, there's, there's quite a few that have gone there. But there's an interesting fact that only 40% of them uh, ever have been successful. So a lot of them have failed on, on entry into the, the atmosphere or crash landed or whatever. So, you know, that's not a great uh, rate to do, but it must be said that the more recent rovers, including uh, Perseverance, Opportunity Spirit, all have landed well, as indeed has the, the, the Chinese Tom Wing. So this gives you an idea of where the different rovers have landed uh, on, on uh, the sites. So uh, Perseverance is up here, and you can see it above it, the, the, the Chinese rovers uh, and that general location as well. This is where Beagle 2 crash landed, it never really made it. But uh, there's quite a few here, uh, here, and you'll notice this other one in yellow, that's the Rosalind Franklin rover. And you might ask, what is that? That's actually the second half of this mission uh, for the Perseverance rover. And we'll talk about the Franklin Rosalind rover in a minute. So this is it, and some of you might recognize uh, this location because this is actually Stevenage. This is the Mars yard at Airbus and Stevenage, which we visited. And here's Tim Peake having a look at the rover. So this part of the mission is the return bit. So it's gonna pick up the samples from Perseverance and take them back. And this is the motley crew of us that visited in 2018 as part of our 50th anniversary for the society. You'll see some faces there that you recognize. But it was a, an interesting day to go there and learn about what Airbus do. And uh, that's, that's what the rover looks like. The, the, Tim Peake gives you an idea of the scale of it. And its main purpose is to go to Mars, pick up the samples, take them to a, a rocket launch pad on Mars from another mission and send them back to Earth. So the, the um, rover actually originated from all the previous technologies that it went before, including the Sojourner, the Mars Exploration Rover, which was spirit and opportunity as they're better known, and uh, the Mars Science Laboratory, which is called Curiosity. So this is one of the differences I mentioned, Curiosity uh, actually sampled um, uh, soil and uh, did the analysis on in situ. Uh, they reckoned that that wasn't really good enough, and that's why they're going to return the samples to Earth uh, for uh, the purpose of analyzing them in detail. 
So they learned a lot of lessons from the previous rovers that have gone there, in particular from Curiosity. Uh, they figured that one of the drawbacks of, of uh, the design was the wheel design. And you mightn't think that's a really important thing, but actually they did give a lot of thought to the wheel design in the first place for Curiosity. But uh, from the experiences that they had with that, they learned an awful lot. Uh, Curiosity's tracks actually left an imprint on Mars and those of you that know Morse code will actually know that uh, that's what it spells out. And it actually spells JPL. So everywhere it went on Mars, it left this little message, JPL, JPL, JPL. Uh, so obviously somebody wanted to make an impression on Mars. Uh, so studying all the issues that they had with the wheels, you can see uh, on these pictures, uh, the degradation uh, but you can see here that uh, this is the earlier ones and as, as the different days progress to, uh, you know, uh, the end of the, the first part of the mission, you can see that the, the, the more and more um, impact on the wheels and there's a close up of the wheels to show you the damage of, that's actually being done. It's, it's pretty serious. A couple of things happened here as well. You notice these red arrows, they point out uh, where there's been fractures to the actual tread. So learning from that, uh, they decided that moving forward, they were going to uh, change the way that the wheels worked. And so they redesigned the wheels so that the wheel on the left is Curiosity's wheel with all these ridges. Uh, and the one on the right is Perseverance. It's got straighter lines. They're still a little bit curved, but they're not forming any traps for, for uh, fracture points to occur. And here's another diagram of it. You'll see that Perseverance wheels now on the left here uh, is, is thinner and taller. It's also made of thicker material and it doesn't have the, the complicated uh, foot pattern that Curiosity had. So one of the things that uh, set apart the previous rovers that went uh, was that for the first time they used the, the sky crane. And they didn't really know how well that was going to work and it was just done with a wing and a prayer. Um, so when it came to Perseverance going, they decided that they were going to try and actually record what happened when the, the, the rover used a sky, sky, sky train to, to deploy uh, the rover on the surface. And we'll talk about the different parts of the rover in a little while. I'm not going to go through them all now, but it's a multinational thing, as you can see, with uh, contributions from many of the European countries, as well as NASA themselves. So the concept of getting the rover to the ground is, is sort of summarized in this uh, slide. You've got what's called the cruise stage, then what's called the back shell, descent stage, the rover itself, and then the heat shield. And if you just think of those parts as a part of a cocoon, um, I'm going to play a short animation of that as it happens, and also a short video of, of the actual deployment of that so you can see what happens. But they came up with this design rather than uh, a parachute to, to just drop the rover on the ground. That hadn't been so successful, and, but this was a much more complicated solution, needed a lot more engineering, but it actually worked very well. And this is a picture of the uh, actual assembly of it uh, at Kennedy. And I took this slide from a talk that I listened to by a guy called George Tahu. Uh, he, he is one of the, the NASA engineers that worked on the project. And it was a very interesting talk indeed, I must say, hearing firsthand from somebody that worked on the project, you know, to get the insights of things that happened. There's the whole thing ready to be uh, packed up in its nose cone to send into space and the launch took place on 30th of July, 2020. And then it went off to Mars. Um, so on the 30th of July, 2020, it left Earth, as you can see over there, and uh, it arrived at Mars on the 18th of February, 2021. And these uh, TCMs are the trajectory correction maneuvers that they have to actually keep the rover on track uh, throughout the, its uh, journey to Mars. So it took about seven months in all to, to get there. And one of the interesting things about these trajectory maneuvers, there were very little manipulation had to be done because they calculated the actual trajectory so well. And that just shows you how science uh, is evolving all the time to give you really accurate um, predictions of how spacecraft are going to react with gravity in, in space and so on. 
Okay, so the, the next stage then is you actually got to land on Mars, which is a bit that uh, most of the other rovers uh, failed in, to achieve. So they call this uh, entry, descent and landing, EDL for short. You'll hear them talk about that in a little video. And so what we've got here is we're just going to look at some of these stages, the parachute deployment, then the heat shield separation, uh, then where the actual rover starts ground sensing using radar to find out where it's going. And then the, the back shell is, is separated. And then finally you have the powered descent. So we're gonna look at some of those things in a moment on the video. Uh, but first of all, one of the other things that was very different about the way the Perseverance rover actually landed on Mars was that with curiosity, when they uh, released it from the sky crane, it dropped us at a specific time, the crane deployed at a specific time, and the parachutes uh, deployed based on the, on the speed. What they decided with this is that they were now going to change it and use something called range trigger. So what they did is they took a, a lot of uh, surveys of the surface of Mars, uh, made maps, and they loaded those maps into the uh, descent vehicle, so the descent vehicle, as it was coming down, could do a comparison of where it was and decide when to deploy uh, the parachute and when to deploy the, the sky crane. So it was a lot smarter than the, the, the previous one, and they wanted to find out how well that actually was going to work. So this is the sort of sequence that happens. So this is the new landing technique. Take some photos, compare it to the map, and then divert if necessary. So it's quite a smart bit of technology to, to, to get the uh, safe landing that they wanted. So this is where they decided to target uh, its Jezero crater. And it's expected to be something like a, a, a river delta that's dried up basically. That's what they're hoping anyway. And so they thought that's a very good place to do some exploration. And the little crosshairs there uh, on the screen show you where the um, actual uh, target was. They had some very detailed uh, maps of it, and you can see the ground radar inset there as well. So this is the sort of picture that the actual descent vehicle would see as it's going down to land. So it, it was a very sort of um, very well thought out system, and but because it was so complex, they weren't sure it was all going to work, and it was a first time for some of this technology. So what they did is for the actual landing, they, they recorded it. So I'm going to play this short video and I hope that everybody can hear the audio. We are starting the straighten up and fly right maneuver where the spacecraft will jettison the entry balance masses in preparation for parachute deploy and to roll over to give the radar a better look at the ground. Applicate in the cage, shoot deploy. The navigation has confirmed that the parachute has deployed and we are seeing significant deceleration in the velocity. Our current velocity is 440 meters per second at an altitude of about 12 kilometers from the surface of Mars. Heat shield set. Perseverance has now slowed to subsonic speeds and the heat shield has been separated. This allows both the radar and the cameras to get their first look at the surface. Current velocity is 145 meters per second and an altitude of about 10 kilom nine and a half kilometers above the surface. So this is novel because you're actually seeing the pictures as they happened. And I don't know if you watched it on the day, but it was quite exciting. Net filter converge. Velocity solution, 3.3 meters per second. Altitude, 7.4 kilometers. Now has radar lock on the ground. Current velocity is about 100 meters per second, 6.6 .6 kilometers of the surface. Perseverance is continuing to descend on the parachute. We are coming up on the initialization of terrain relative navigation and subsequently the priming of the landing engines. Our current velocity is about 90 meters per second at an altitude of 4.2 kilometers. So if you watch the icons at the bottom of the screen here, you can see what's happening. We have confirmation that the lander vision system has produced a valid solution and part of terrain relative navigation. Priming, TBA is nominal. We have priming of the landing engines. Back shell set. Current velocity is 
83 meters per second at about 2.6 kilometers from the surface of Mars. We have confirmation that the back shell has separated. We are currently performing the divert maneuver. Current velocity is about 75 meters per second at an altitude of about a kilometer off the surface of Mars. Gear and safety, Bravo. We have completed our terrain relative navigation. Current speed is about 30 meters per second, altitude of about 300 meters off the surface of Mars. You'll see the dust begin to kick up now as it gets closer. We have started our constant velocity accordion, which means we are conducting the sky crane, about to conduct the sky crane maneuver. So the cameras on the sky left are looking up started. and looking down? About 20 meters off the surface. We're getting signals from MRO. Tango Delta. Touchdown confirmed. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars, ready to begin seeking the sands of past life. So that was quite an exciting achievement to do that and document it because they'd not seen how it had performed before. Um, one of the things you might have noticed there, the parachute. Um, and, and there's an interesting story behind that because it was actually made here in the UK. And no sooner had uh, the video of that been released by NASA than some bright spark said, I think there's a message there. So they did a screen capture and they sat down with a pen and marked out different segments. And it did contain a, a hidden message. And it says, Dare Mighty Things, which is the, the motto of JPL. Uh, there are some other additional information there about the latitude and longitude of JPL, but it was quite an interesting thing. But it's amazing how people so quickly, I think this was done like within 40 minutes of the, the rover landing. It, it just absolutely amazed me that, you know, you could do that. But this, the interesting thing about the parachute is that it's very, very difficult to design parachutes that apply at hypersonic speeds. And the Americans couldn't do it, but they came to this factory in Tiverton and they were able to make the materials that actually were used to build that parachute and they actually built the parachute for it. So Britain had a part to play in that as well, which is nice to know. So we'll just we'll talk a little bit about the different instruments on the rover. Um, the reason I'll only go, I'm gonna scratch the surface on this one, but I'm going to mention this because there's a big difference between this and uh, the, the previous rovers. The previous rovers were uh, drilling and sampling and actually measuring. Um, Perseverance was designed to do analysis, but without actually doing a lot of the uh, drilling and uh, necessary uh, analysis that you take a, a soil sample out and analyze it. So they were able to do tools that would allow you to do that from a distance from you know a few meters away. And I'll talk about some of these instruments just to, to highlight the differences in. Uh, the mass cam is the, the, the camera right on top of the boom, and it's a high resolution camera. There's also a panoramic camera there as well. So you're able to get uh, very wide shots as well. The next one along is the super cam. <laughs> it's still on the same uh, assembly, uh, but this is a laser micro imager. And what that allows you to do is actually look at the structures of uh, rocks that are several meters away and analyze what they're actually made of. There's a weather station on board called MEDA. Uh, there's also uh, an ultraviolet spectrometer and that's called Sherlock. And of course you can't have a Sherlock without a Watson and they've got a Watson camera there. I think they had to work hard at the abbreviations to make the Watson up. I'll talk about that in a second. But then we the thing called Pixel, it's an X-ray spectrometer on that head. It allows you to see structures that you cannot see with the other cameras in the X-ray spectrum. MOXIE is the um, oxygen generation experiment that was put on board so they could test the theory of uh, converting Mars atmosphere into breathable oxygen. RIMFAX is a ground radar. Uh, so it's a subsurface radar, looks at what's underneath the surface, and it'll go down about 10 meters below the surface. So there's a total of 23 cameras on this, uh, nine engineering cameras, seven science cameras, and as you saw from the entry and descent landing, there were seven cameras actually used to record all of that. 
So that it's very different in terms of uh, what it's equipped with. It has one thing in common with, with the previous rovers, it, its power source. It uses something called a radioisotope thermoelectric generator, or RTG for short. Basically, it's a, a nuclear reactor that uh, generates electricity. And to do this, they use plutonium. So the plutonium, and they chose plutonium for various reasons, uh, because it maximized the alpha radiation, minimized the beta and gamma radiations, which are harmful to electronics and uh, things around it. So this RTG is a portable power source, basically. It's actually made up of 4.8 kilograms of plutonium dioxide. And uh, they chose that material because it has a, a half-life of 187 years. Some of the earlier um, radioactive materials that they use had only a half-life of, you know, like 100 days. So it meant that you couldn't actually run a long mission. So they decided on this one to use that particular version of plutonium. Uh, the generator itself works on something called the Seebeck effect, which is basically that radiation generates heat, and with heat you can actually generate electricity. And we'll have a quick look at that, how that works. So in, in this diagram here, you've got the heat over on this side, you've got your PNN type materials, and then you've got a cold surface. And basically what happens is that as you apply heat to these, uh, the uh, it causes a differential in the P and N types. So you get a current flow around. So the heat, the heat actually transfers and generates electricity uh, in that fashion. So that will power the uh, rover for quite a while. Um, it's not a huge output, it's uh, 110 watts. So it's quite small, uh, but it's gonna last for you know a half-life of 187 years. So in 187 years, it's gonna be generating approximately half that's so 55 watts ish. So I'm going to talk now very quickly about the mass cam. It's a high resolution, uh, high definition video panoramic and color camera. It also does 3D images as well. And the idea is that it can take detailed pictures of not only the ground, but the Martian atmosphere as well. It has a zoom lens, so it can look at objects that are further away. So what else is there to say about it? Its electronics are based down on the, the uh, body of, of the uh, device. The reason for that is that Mars' atmosphere is quite thin. It's about uh, 100 times thinner than the Earth's atmosphere. So the rays coming off the sun affect electronics more than they would on Earth. So all of the sensitive electronic equipment is housed in the body of, of, of the rover. So that's a picture of the, uh, the twin lenses that uh, form stereo for the capture of 3D imaging. The mast cam was the first 360 panorama image was taken in February uh, when it landed. That's it landed on the 18th of February, remember? And so on the 21st, it was deployed to take its first pictures. First few days are always used checking out uh, things. So they got up and running pretty quickly. And here you can see a panoramic image with an inset of an object uh, in the distance over there. So that's the object and there. So it gives you an idea of the sort of resolution that it can do. They then took a, a panoramic image of, of the crater rim so they could see. And what I've decided to do is just take a close up area here so you could see what it looks like when it's a little bit closer up. So it's a fairly highly detailed image. And you know, to get this up and running and get the color balance and everything sorted out very quickly is, is uh, quite a feat. Uh, you might have noticed that on the actual rover itself, there are some uh, test patterns and things that they use for setup. The SuperCam uh, examines rocks and soils with, the, with its camera, and it, it has a laser and a spectrometer so that when it fires a laser, at the object uh, that it's of interest, the rock, it, it gets um, feedback of the different types of luminescence that happens when you blast a rock with laser. And that can tell you an awful lot about the makeup of that rock. So it can do from that around 20 feet away, seven meters. It's situated on that top area as well. And this is what it looks like close up. Uh, the weather instruments, they wanted to analyze the atmosphere of Mars, and uh, they'd seen previous occasions where they've seen dust devils, where winds on Mars occur. 
and uh, they just wanted to know a little bit more about how weather works on Mars, and that's why they put this weather station in. It was uh, built by the Spanish contribution to the, to the project, and it measures dust particles, it does all sorts, wind direction, temperature, humidity, the usual stuff, but some other stuff as well. It particularly was interested in looking at the Martian atmosphere, and that's what it looks like. Built-in weather station. Then you move on to this other instrument called Sherlock. So they've come up with a, an acronym for it, scanning habitable environments with Raman and luminescence uh, for organics, chemicals. So it's quite a long-winded name. So Sherlock is probably a lot better. But the idea behind it is that you can find out from the uh, luminescence from the rock uh, what sort of organics are associated with it. And uh, it, looking at the fine scale uh, of minerals uh, down at all, almost to molecular level. And to, to also look for biosignatures of, of potential life that might have existed some time ago. So in addition to its black and white context camera, Sherlock is assisted by Watson. So this is why they came up with this other camera and had to name it Watson. And it must have taken them ages to figure out that they're going to call that the wide angle topographic sensor for operations and engineering with the N from engineering. They really worked hard, I think, at getting that acronym to work. But uh, uh, there you go. That's what they do. So a little bit about this Raman and luminescence, what it is, because it's quite an important thing. When you fire a laser at a material, you get uh, certain reactions from that in different spectra and different energy levels of excitement as a result of that. And I'm not an expert in this, but the Raman luminescence will tell you roughly here, when you see uh, the different elements in this case, you've got uh, you know oxides, you've got gypsum, you've got epsonite and mudstone, uh, and they all behave in different ways. And these are uh, test samples that they used on earth to, to generate these graphs to give you an idea of what uh, you can learn from, the, from that particular instrument. And this is what it looks like when you look at it. Uh, uh, it. You can see the luminescence occurring from the different parts of the different elements. And these correspond to the peaks on the graphs as well. So there's another representation of that. So the Raman shift tells them uh, that there's potentially the presence of life in, in these organic type of materials. It's not a given, but it's one of the ways that they can determine if uh, there were biosignatures present or not. So they actually got to do some of the, the real tests uh, for this. And the picture on the left is the actual borehole, the sample hole that they drilled for it. And that's the view from Sherlock. And then on the one on the right, that's Watson. So the Watson is, is a, like just taking a, a visual of it while Sherlock highlights the different areas of the different uh, luminescence that's been projected back. Then there's another instrument called Pixel. It's the planetary instrument for X-ray lithochemistry. So again, it's looking uh, at the soil samples for in the X-ray spectrum to find out in a, a fine scale what's actually uh, happening in, in the chemistry of the rock. It's uh, situated at the front of the device and there you go, you can see a picture of it. So what it does is it has an X-ray spectrometer, so it identifies chemical elements based on uh, that and it can do that to down to a very tiny scale. It takes very close up pictures of those samples uh, using the zoom lens and uh, it, it takes the pictures of the rock and soil sample textures. It can see uh, features as small as a grain of salt. Uh, the idea was to look for signs of past microbial life on, on Mars. Uh, this is uh, something that was found on a Mars meteorite some years ago and that's the sort of thing they're looking for to see if there was something like that. This may have been explained by other formations, but that's the sort of thing that it might look like if they were to find it. So far they haven't, uh, but I'm sure one day they will find something. Then RIMFAX is just a, a radar imager uh, to look at the subsurface. So in other words, what's going on underneath the surface of Mars. It's situated at, at the back of the rover and it's a box uh, built like this. So it's about two feet wide by about two feet deep. <coughs> and built by uh, Norwegians in this case, part of the mountain. And you can see here where it's uh, situated so that it, it bounces radar down underneath the surface. 
And as it goes along, it, it generates this radar image of what's beneath the surface. So that's the first as well. Now that, that will go from about uh, 10 meters down. So if there's a difference in the structures of the uh, soil underneath, they're gonna find out about it. I think they're hoping that they would see something like maybe remnants of water or whatever, but you never know. So on to one of the main experiments that they were keen to try out here called MOXIE, the Mars Oxygen in Situ Resource Utilization Experiment. So in other words, it's taking the Mars atmosphere, which is carbon dioxide and converting it into oxygen. And this was just a, a test bed. It's one of these projects that they did that not really going to be very useful uh, in this mission, but it's a, a test bed to prove that the theory works and it can be done. So this is what it looks like. You can see from the scale of the human hand here, it's about a foot high, about nine inches rectangle. And in there is a, a device that uh, takes in the carbon dioxide, filters it, and uses compressor to compress it. Because remember, Mars atmosphere is 100 times thinner than Earth's atmosphere. So you need 100 times more material to produce the same sort of levels of material at the output. So uh, the idea behind this is that when we send humans to Mars, that we want them to be able to return safely, but also while they're there to have some oxygen to breathe. So uh, this MOXIE experiment produces both oxygen and uh, liquid oxygen as a propellant that can be used as well. Some people have asked me why they bothered doing that, because don't they make oxygen on the International Space Station? Well, actually, the answer is they don't really do it in the same way. They do it by electrolysis, and that means that they have to have water delivered to the space station. Now, delivering water to Mars is a different ballgame. Getting it up to the space station for one thing, but getting it to Mars is different. So that's why they couldn't use the electrolysis type of approach to generate oxygen. So electrolysis on the space station to generate the oxygen hydrogen then reacted with the carbon dioxide and produces water and methane. Uh, methane is useless, so they just eject that out into space. So that's basically what that process is on, on the space station. Uh, this is a diagram of the MOXIE, how it's put together. They've got the compressor at the bottom. They've got the uh, solid oxide electrolysis assembly here, a sensor panel, and then there's the, the, some electronics on the roof. But one of the things that interests me is that uh, they had a problem trying to design a reliable compressor that would work on low atmospheres. So they came up with this scroll compressor. Now, I'd never heard of a scroll compressor. Maybe some of you have, but I thought it was quite an interesting uh, thing to do. So I'm going to run this short animation scroll compressor that will play ball with me. So you can see there are two scrolls. They're the only moving parts in it. And as the intake takes uh, uh, Martian air in, it progressively gets narrower as it goes down through the tubes. So therefore it compresses it. And by the time it gets to the, the center area, it's compressed a hundred times. So making it the same sort of level of atmosphere as it would be on earth. So I thought that was quite a clever way of doing the compression. And also because it, it runs on uh, the electricity, it's quite, um, a low power consuming device. Now you can't imagine a petrol compressor or anything like that being something that they'd want to do there. So it's lightweight, it's energy efficient and it's reliable. The way it works is it takes in the, the carbon dioxide through the CO2 feed there that you see, then uh, it, through the filtration, it, it ejects the oxygen. There is an exhaust as well there that you can see, but that's uh, the basic principle of it. I'm not going to go into the chemistry of it for it because I'm not a chemist, but you can see on the slide the, the basic reaction. So using um, electricity to cause the reaction. Now, there's an unfortunate side effect of this. It requires a lot of electricity to do this. And to make this device work, it requires 150 watts of energy. You might remember at the start, I said that the generator on board only produces 110 watts. So they had a bit of a problem there. They solved the problem by having a couple of batteries added to the rover that stored a bit of uh, charge so that this experiment could run. Well, this experiment runs, they can't really do much else. So it was only a, a trial experiment to try to see if it was possible. They have actually succeeded in doing it. And it produces about uh, 20 grams of oxygen in an hour. 
They just wanted to prove the theory that it works because the idea is that back on Earth, they've built a bigger version of this that they could actually send to Mars that could generate enough oxygen for several people to survive on Mars indefinitely, more or less, from the point of view of having oxygen. So it was really just a, a tester to see what would happen. The, the rover computer is quite interesting too. I'm not going to go into the actual details of it, but it's um, an RDA 750 computer uh, and it works with a, a field gate array. Now, the interesting thing about this computer is for those eagle eyes, it says BAE systems on it and everybody knows that that's made here. So this computer chip, it's a hardened chip specifically designed for military operations it's radiation proof and so on, was chosen by NASA to be the, the main processor in this uh, device. So it, it's interesting, again, that British technology has stepped up and solved problems that uh, Americans found difficult to, to overcome. Mars is not a very nice environment. It's very hostile in terms of radiation. It's carbon dioxide, low pressure. So that there's lots of problems there to overcome as well. But interesting to know that it's more or less an off-the-shelf uh, computer that's doing that. And you can see some facts about it there. Two gigabyte of flash memory. That's eight times that of spirit and opportunity. 256 megabits of DRAM and 256 kilobytes of EEPROM. So they're not huge. They're trying to keep, you know, a power consumption down. And the uh, system is, is, is meant to be working on a very efficient uh, OS, which is called Wind Rivers BX Works. This does all of the housekeeping, if you like, for the for the rover. It, it knows of, it tells the wheels which way to go. It does navigation and so on as well. So one of the other main differences between this rover and the previous rovers is that it's designed to do sample handling. So in other words, it's going to pick up samples, but it's not really going to analyze them. And uh, so it's going to collect samples. And to do that, it's got a sample caching mechanism. So it's going to collect uh, various tubes. It's got 43 tubes that it's going to collect. It also has five witness tubes. The witness tubes are used to take a sample of the Martian air at the point where some of the samples are being taken. The reason for doing that is that if the rover accidentally put some molecules in the air, that shouldn't be there. They've got a, a sample tube that says, this is what the air content was like before we took the samples. So they can compare and see if they've put any uh, trace elements in there that shouldn't be there. So it's, it's the equivalent of uh, darks on a astrophotography, I think basically it's a way of finding out what the blemishes are. So it's got onboard storage and it's got eventually going to drop these off. So I'm just going to take a quick look at what's happened. So since it's landed, uh, this was the landing site. It's traversed down to here. It's currently down around here at the moment. And um, it did its first attempt at uh, getting some samples on the 6th of August. And this is what it did. It drilled a hole in, in the Martian ground and thought, OK, good, we'll take a sample of that. So. Uh, they did that, but when they looked at the head, which is here, there was nothing in the tube. And it took them a while to figure out that actually the soil that they drilled into was so crumbly that it actually fell back out of the tube again. So the first attempt wasn't successful. They didn't actually get anything to, to put in the cache. But uh, they decided to have another attempt a month later on the 6th of September. So this time they chose a, a rock, a solid rock. Here it is here in the center. And you can see the drill hole there. And this time, um, before they did it, uh, the JPL director uh, came up and said, you know, there's over 3,000 parts in this system of sampling and it's complex. So we might not get it right. Uh, but it's, it's the most complex sampling mechanism that's ever been in this, sent into space. And um, I'll, I'll try and show you what that looks like in a minute. But um, second attempt at sampling was more successful. On the left here, you can see that there is something in the core. But they do a maneuver, which is a little tap on the head after they've taken the sample. And after they did that, they ended up with this picture. And it looked pretty bleak. It looked as if they'd sort of dumped the sample. But one of the guys says, I'm not happy with the shadows on this picture. So let's uh, 
tomorrow, let's take a different picture when the sun's at a different angle. So sure enough, the next day, they took a sample picture again. And this time you can actually see that there is a sample present in the tube. So that was classed as being a successful sample. So they were able to cache that one. Uh, so that's uh, the artist impression of what the rover looks like as it's drilling into the surface. So the idea with it, this is that uh, they're going to eventually return these samples to Earth. And the way it happens is that uh, the rover over here does its collection, drops them at a, a cache point, and that's what's called the primary objective. So once they've done that, that's the primary objective achieved. But they've set what's called secondary objectives, and these are the secondary objectives to go to other locations, get samples, and take them back to the cache site. So the cache site is where the uh, Rosalind Franklin rover is going to pick up the samples from. And that's the uh, rover that's uh, being built at Stevenage and going to go uh, uh, into space next year, I think it is. Then the idea is that it's going to be loaded on board this little rocket and shot back to Earth. The rocket itself is not actually going to go back to Earth because it's actually going to go into Mars orbit. So here's a, a little animation of what this uh, sample and return mission should look like. If I can make it play for you. Spacecraft sent up from Earth uh, orbits Mars. The samples from Mars picked up by the rover sent into orbit. The orbiting spacecraft uh, rendezvous with the samples that have come up, collect them and goes back to Earth. Talk about ingenuity. So technologies on Earth have been evolving, particularly in the line of drones and autonomous vehicles. So they decided that for uh, this project, uh, the Perseverance project, they were going to put a helicopter on board and they called it Ingenuity. It's a very small craft. It's about 19 inches tall, I think, something like that sort of size. It's lightweight and uh, it's an experimental aircraft. It's not meant to do any specific real science, but as you'll find out in a minute, it, it, it has actually a lot of interesting facts about it. It was really a technology demonstrator just to show that they could actually fly on Mars. Remember the atmosphere, 100 times thinner, a bit of a challenge to get aircraft to fly there. It's only got a flight time of about 90 seconds and a range of 300 meters meters, excuse me, um, it typically fly to an altitude of only eight meters. So it's not, uh, you know, your typical drone that you see on Earth. Interestingly enough, they got a swatch of the Wright Brothers fabric from the, the, the plane that flew at Kitty Hawk, and it's attached to just where the solar panel is. On top of the uh, helicopter right at the very top is the solar panel and a little antenna there. I'll look at that in a minute. It's got a couple of cameras on board a color camera for an oblique view of terrain and black and white one for navigation. Runs on a Linux OS and uses a Snapdragon 801 CPU, which is typically used in cell phones. So again, they're using pretty off the shelf technologies here rather than develop anything new. Uh, the, the antenna that is, is the key to linking back to uh, Perseverance and then eventually back to Earth. And it uses contra-rotating rotors because if they didn't have a contra-rotating rotor, they'd have to put a tail rotor to make the device more complex, add to the weight and so on. So they try to keep it small and powerful. And they did that. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all the different parts, but just basically you've got the main uh, avionics are down here. You've got the contra-rotating uh, blades here. They've got a very steep angle because the air is thin, it's very different. And those are blades are about 1.9 meters wide, I think. Uh, solar panel on top to power it. So it can fly, fly for 90 seconds and it's got a recharge and uh, basically off it goes again. 
Span is 1.2 meters, sorry, in height 48 centimeters. Weight is 1.8 kilograms. Interestingly enough, the weight on Earth is four pounds. On Mars, it's one in 1.5 pounds, so it's a lot lighter on Mars. So these are all the things they had to factor in when designing this mission to, 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 to prove this, how it would work. Um, it's got a swashplate for those of you that are interested in helicopters. It's got a swashplate just like a normal helicopter. And it's uh, basically a, a pretty complex little box of tricks. So to get it onto Mars, basically just fit it underneath the rover body. And then it was covered by a shell, which was dropped away. When the shell was dropped away, the rover moved away. And then the actual rover itself was, uh, the ingenuity was deployed. Its legs came down and then the rover moved off again, leaving it sitting on the ground. So this in itself was a bit of feat of engineering to get all of that to happen. But eventually they got there and on the 19th of April, they had their first flight and it's, there he goes, okay. So not a particularly interesting flight. It, it uh, went through a preset maneuver of uh, rising vertically, doing a quarter turn, and then basically hovering and then coming back to ground again. But that was actually the first flight of a um, drone on another planet. There are plans to put drones on other planets as well, not quite the same as this, but this was a, really a, a test bed to see what, what could be done. So that uh, caused a lot of excitement and it was a success. So then they decided to try some other things. They wanted to scale up the operations of Ingenuity just to see what they could do with it. So they made a test flight. And then on the 27th of April, they had this picture taken from it. And if you look at the corner there, that's actually the uh, picture of Perseverance on the, the Martian surface taken from Ingenuity. So that again was a, a milestone that uh, proved that the technology worked. These were all the mission goals that they'd set out for Ingenuity. Within the first few days, they'd achieved all of their goals. But like with all of these things, they decided that they were going to try and do a little bit more. So they moved forward and uh, they started and had a pilot's logbook for the, the helicopter to log all the flights and what's been done. And actually to date, it's done 13 flights and designed originally with this flight time of 90 seconds, range of 30 meters, 300 meters and an altitude of eight meters. Well, it exceeded the, the flight time from 90 seconds to 169.5 seconds. That's quite an achievement. They then covered 625 meters horizontal distance instead of 300. So they doubled the, the range that it was originally intended to do. And then the height, uh, they flew it to 12 meters several times just to go a little bit further. And they realized that actually now it could actually be a valuable tool as well. So you probably can't see this very well, it's very faint, but there's a yellow outline there. That was the original flight plan for, that it was meant to do for the test bed uh, experiments. So all those tick boxes we did before were done within that area. Since then, there's the test bed up there. It's actually followed the rover and the yellow line here represents uh, the helicopter path. It's actually kept track with uh, the, the, the ground rover itself and has been able to, to keep up by doing short hops and so on. But in addition to that, it's actually been able to do something a little bit more useful. And this is a picture of a mound that it examined. Now, Perseverance couldn't get near the mound because of the terrain. So this was the idea of testing out the aerial devices like Ingenuity to see if they could use it to go in places that the rover couldn't go. So I think the, the, you know, the whole thing was a, a pretty much a, a success. One of the other novel things that they did with this mission is to record sounds on Mars. And I'm going to try and highlight that and see if I can do it by giving you some samples of what it is. But basically, the, there's a, a microphone on the supercam, and then there was also uh, a mic on the body. The EDL is the, uh, do you remember the entry, descent, and landing? Because they wanted to record what happened when that went down. There's a number of challenges when you're recording sound on Mars. It's cold, it's minus 63 degrees. Uh, the air density is 100th that of Earth. For sound to travel, for my voice waves to reach you, it has to travel through air. If the air is 100 times thinner, it's much harder to actually uh, get that sound to travel there. And also the air is a different composition. It's not oxygen like we have, it's 96% carbon dioxide. 
So the speed of sound is also slower on Mars uh, compared to Earth as well. So that's uh, the so th if this works, uh, what I'm going to do is going to play a sound. And it plays the sound as it sounds on Earth and then as it would sound on Mars. Maybe you might need to turn it up a bit, Steve. Oh, sorry. So this is the sound on Earth. And that's what it sounds like on Mars. There's a couple of other samples that I'll show you. So it's, it's interesting to see the different effects. Now, these are simulated sounds. They have actually recorded some uh, Martian sounds of the wheels of the rover and uh, wind on Mars. They don't make very interesting listening, so I've not really included them here. But one of the other things they did with Perseverance that they didn't do with previous rovers is they personalized it. You've all had personalized number plates. Well, Mars has got this, uh, Perseverance has got its own personalized number plate. And this graphic explains the naming mechanism that they use for, for naming it. Uh, I won't go into all the detail of that, but just to let you know that it happens. And then also they put on um, a diagram that shows a uh, solar system and relationship of uh, Earth to Mars and so on. And up here, there's a little uh, plate as well, which I'll tell you about in a minute. So they put a name badge on a Perseverance and it got strapped on. They also put uh, the history and the genealogy, uh, the origins of, of the rover, starting with uh, Sojourner, right at the end, going up to uh, Perseverance and Ingenuity. They also put uh, DNA strands, uh, part of the tires actually, or uh, the American flag, of course, JPL, the NASA badge, and that's the, what the plate actually looks like uh, mounted on, on the rover itself. And if we look at uh, over here, there are three chips here with names, uh, 10.9 million names on. And it's not an electronic chip. They are actually engraved names. And one of them is Stephen Helsiger. Steve got his ticket for that. So his name is on Mars. So yeah, I thought that was interesting. I didn't realize you could do that, but there you go. We're nearing the end of this anyway, but the last bit is that, uh, how does the rover actually communicate with it? Well, it uses something called the Mars Relay Network. And there are some satellites in orbit around Mars, uh, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, Mars Odyssey, MAVEN, ExoMars, and uh, Mars Express. And these are used, these are the, if you like, the American versions. There are other satellites from other countries around as well, but these are the ones that are used for the perseverance communications. So the idea is that all of these tools are used to keep in contact with the uh, rover and it's connected back to Earth to Goldstone. Uh, JPL have got their space network. It's in the Mojave Desert. And... Uh, it works in conjunction with, with three other stations throughout the world. There's Australia, there's California, and then so Spain as well. And these are the different dishes at different sizes that uh, work um, on that space network. Well, we sort of know that Perseverance is continuing its mission. And if it does as well as Opportunity did, uh, then it's got a long life ahead of it. 
So, so far it's uh, here and it's covered uh, approximately, I think it's about 1.8 or 1.9 miles, which doesn't sound a lot, but it's actually traveling about six times faster than uh, Curiosity did. And it will only get faster. And one of the reasons that it will get faster is that Curiosity needed the people on the ground to tell it where to go. This rover has got autonomous navigation in it, so it finds its own way. So it looks at the terrain around it, decides that that's an obstacle. Uh, I'm going to avoid that and makes its own decisions. So what the mission controllers do is say, I want you to go and look at a specific area and it will work its way towards that. And that's a much quicker way of, of making the rover progress over the surface of, of Mars. So really that wraps it up as far as I'm concerned in terms of the, uh, what, I, what I plan to do. So thanks very much. But if you have any questions, I'll do my best to answer them. And if you don't, it's even better because that means we can move on. <laughs> is, the, is the journey it, it, it went on Mars? Was that pre-programmed, or was it just giving instructions? They decided when they were landing at Jezero Crater, there was a number of targets they wanted to visit. So it's on the first part of that process to actually do that, uh, and uh, so it's only travelled. Uh, 1.2 kilometers or something or 1.2 miles now it's it's still got a long way to go so there's a lot of other stuff that they've got to they've got to make their way right back over to the edge of the the delta and that will take several months to do that uh, then they will perform some more samples and then they've got to go obviously to the cache base where they're going to drop all the samples off as well so there's still quite a few years of work to be done with that rover yeah Well, the Chinese have already landed one there. The, the, the Taiwan, it, it was uh, a great success, actually. You did, probably didn't hear very much about it. But bearing in mind that it's their first attempt at getting a rover on Mars, all the obstacles that they had to do to overcome that, they had to have space communication so they could communicate with it and get the signals back. They got to launch it, make it land safely, deploy it, get it off the uh, bed. They used a slightly different construction to the Americans. Um, but they achieved that, and so they've already got their Mars rover there, uh, and that landed in August, I think, this year. So there will be others. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, the earlier rovers had um, sundown on Mars bags. They don't disappoint us. I don't think it has. No, no. It's an interesting thing because on some of the pictures I've seen from uh, Opportunity and, and Curiosity, you can see shadows being cast. So it's, it's eminently possible to do that. I know you're the expert on sundials. Anything else? Oh, one more, yeah. Yeah, um, good question, because, you know, whenever you're in another atmosphere or, or another planet where it doesn't have the same atmosphere as Earth, you've got to be really careful. So the astronauts have to protect themselves. Uh, for example, on the moon, they have the spacesuits that they wear protect them from the radiation, because even on the moon, you're going to get radiation that uh, could be harmful. Uh, on Mars, the radiation is also pretty bad because the air is so thin. So anybody that goes to Mars, uh, they have to build habitats that are radiation proof to, to allow them to live there. And the same with any exploration that they go and do if, if human uh, people are, are present uh, in that exploration. But yes, yeah, they, they need to be very careful. And then the obstacles, of course, Interestingly enough, when Apollo 11 landed on the moon, they were very afraid of falling through, the, that there was a crust on the moon and that they would just fall down a big hole and go into a, you know, a, a, a ravine or a crevice or something like that. Uh, on Mars, they had a lot more uh, knowledge of the um, solidity of, of the, the areas that they were landing on and uh, because they were able to do uh, mapping from, from the orbiters that were going around. That wasn't that possible with the moon landings, they, they used a different technique of, of just taking pictures. But uh, when they went to Mars, they had radar and all sorts of uh, different uh, uh, bits of data that they could work with to make sure that everything was going to be okay.
And part of the reason for choosing the Jezero crater was that it was uh, deemed to be a, a, a safe area to land and an area also that using the terrain navigation that they have built on board the descent vehicle that they would know that they would uh, get a pretty successful landing in terms of choosing the right target. Okay.